Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to um, the this very impromptu seminar on West African history before the 1600s. Um, if you have no idea who I am, um, I'm Nick Dennis. I, I just helped organise this because it stemmed from a conversation on Twitter last week. Um, and I just asked a few people if they wanted to get involved. Um, and, and fantastically, they, they've said yes. Um, so the, the two main people who are going to be um, talking today, I'm just helping to facilitate things, are uh, Professor Trevor Getz, who's from the San Francisco State University. Um, he's a professor of history there. Um, he's specialising in, in African history. He's also the lead historian for the World History Project. Um, I spent a week with Trevor um, during February half term. Um, and I think I can safely say he's a legend as well, um, beyond, I'm um, just saying, an amazing historian. Um, his book, um, A Primer for Teaching African History, is, I think, absolutely essential in terms of reading material for designing a course. So um, if you haven't had a look at that, please do. I will send some links to that um, after the webinar um, and along with some other materials. Um, but you know, I think it's really, really important we're talking about how we can use the, the kind of knowledge that we have to create a really good course. The design principles that Trevor um, talks about in the book, and I know we'll talk a bit about later on, are fantastic. So, you know, absolutely essential reading. Um, and, um, you know, the, the other person who I'm really pleased to meet Toby again, I've met um, Dr. Toby Green previously at a, a history conference and he agreed to, to come in and, and talk to us as well. He's a lecturer, a senior lecturer, at King's College London, uh, specialising in this area. And his book, A Fistful of Shells, if you, also if you haven't read that, um, please do, it is amazing. Um, and you know, I've learned so much just from reading parts of it myself. And I know a number of other people I've spoken to have um, really enjoyed that too. Um, so I will also send links to um, that information to everyone. Um, there are some resources in terms of the presentation and some of the materials that Trevor has produced, um, which are available for download, uh, but we will send that out to everybody because we couldn't put everything on everything in on the webinar, um, but please have a look. But before we kind of launch into anything else, I'm just going to um, launch a few polls so we can get some information. So I'm going to put them up. We're going to have two polls to begin with. Um, and I'll give a few seconds for everyone to answer. So the first one is coming up now. So if you can just please click. Okay, All right, I'm just gonna give it another couple of more seconds. So, um, in terms of do you currently teach African history or the history of West Africa before the 1600s? Only 24% of you, and we're full, I believe, which is over 100 people here, have said uh, yes, and 76% have said no, um, which is fascinating. And the next poll is up now. So, would you be interested in a follow up session that focused on the questions provided? These were the ones that people um, submitted when they registered um, initially. Okay, this is this is great. The uh, I think there were so many questions um, involved that you know, I, we could have spent the whole webinar just talking about those questions rather than um, actually focusing on the content. So um, that's great. We will be doing a, a follow up session. And um, you know we'll, we'll see what happens. So, so further details will come along with that. So just very quickly in terms of the format, um, Toby um, is going to talk first um, in terms and give us a, a real good overview of West African history. Trevor is then going to get into the, the kind of detail in terms of curriculum planning around that, and then hopefully we'll have some time uh, for questions at the end as well. So um, you know that. That's the, the format. We'll see how it goes. Um, please use the hands up to you know, um, ask any questions. I will be uh, keeping an, uh, an eye on those and we'll see how many we can do at the end. OK, so without further ado, um, I'm going to disappear and uh, hand over the screen to Toby.
he says. <laughs> right. Hello. Hello, everybody. I'm just going to share my webcam. Okay. Can people should be able to see me now? I'm not sure if everybody can see my screen. Nick. Can yeah, see my screen? it's coming up now. It should be coming up it's now. Coming up. Perfect. Okay. Okay. Great. Okay. Yeah. I think uh, everybody can see me and I think everybody can hear me. So I'm going to start. So thank you very much, Nick and Trevor, for inviting me to to be involved in this. Um, uh, it's it's just great because uh, at the moment we've all got a lot. We've all got some time uh, and it, this is the sort of thing. I mean, I was supposed to be doing a, a teaching history event with colleagues at the British Museum, which we had to cancel. So. It's great to have this is a fantastic thing to be doing and as Tr trevor and i were talking the other day yesterday you know this is something we, we both feel passionate about not only researching uh the history of of africa and, and teaching at a university but also developing materials and sharing those materials as widely as possible so that um it's not just it's it's not you know the day that i stand in stand uh teaching african history at university and and, and students say, well, we've already covered this, will be the day I feel I've done my job well, and um, that's uh, still a long way off. Uh, but I was encouraged, actually, by the first poll, 24% of you teaching African history, West African history um, before 1600. I think that that's actually higher than I would have guessed, so I'm really pleased about that. Um, okay, uh, just uh, taking th taking us through what I'm gonna be um, covering in this, in this presentation. So uh, what we've decided to do Trevor, Trevor and I is um, is focus on uh, what well, I'm I'm going to give a bit of an overview on opportunities for teaching uh, in secondary school African history. Now I know a lot of a lot of you will probably know quite a bit about that. Some of you may not. So just uh, uh, as I'm quite familiar with the the with the kind of panorama in 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 British uh, secondary education, I'll just talk a little bit about that. So um, that will be the first part: opportunities and resources. Uh, then um, we're going to look uh, in more detail. At, I think a lot of my my part is going to be sort of framing really how to, to, some of the things in a way really that Trevor looks at so in such important detail in his book uh, on primary for teaching African history because in order to teach the history of Africa there are lots of layers which we have to unpick um, and and layers in terms of preconceptions, layers in terms of um, what's a valid source and how we use sources. And actually, that's really important material for historians of any description because it helps. It's a very important resource, really, African history for thinking about what history is, how we create discourses and what we deem to be valid sources. Uh, so all of those are really important to understand as a grounding card, really, before we before we even begin to enter the classroom. And, and you know, and a lot of that is is uh, covered, as, as I say, in, in Trevor's book. Um, and uh, and then some of that will also be involved. The third point in this slide about conceptual frames of Africa, which includes Africa's historical relationship with Europe, uh, and the question of slavery. And then I'm going to finish with a, with some detail on fleshing out some detail on one on on, an, on one example, uh, which can which then Trevor's going to explore in a lot more detail. Uh, in, in your session, Trevor, which is on the Kingdom of Congo. So that's going to be the final um, part of the, the of, of my session. So um, I think we both thought this session, uh, we would try and speak for around 40 minutes or so, thereabouts, 40 minutes, 45 minutes, and that will then hopefully give 10 or 15 minutes at the end for questions. Uh, so I'm going to aim to finish by 4.40, 4 4.45 or thereabouts if I can. Okay. Um, so first of all, you know, why teach uh, distant, distant African history? Um, and I think here are some of the key things about why teaching African history is not only important for understanding the history of Africa, but important for the discipline of history and understanding what that is come, come across in this slide. It really does broaden how uh, people in any place in the world think about what history is, how we gain knowledge about the past, what the source bases are. Historians of the distant African past use a variety of sources which traditional historians would not necessarily think of as part of the historical toolkit, the visual sources, as we'll see in a minute, archaeology, and particularly 
uh, perhaps controversial for traditional histori historians would be oral history. Um, in fact, I mean, I've made a lot of use of oral history in, in, in my research. Um, I've, I've worked in an archive in the Gambia, an oral history archive, which has material which dates back four or five hundred years. Uh, and for traditional historians, that kind of approach is uh, hard to make sense of. Uh, and when understanding that kind of approach helps to broaden our understanding of what history is and how we produce historical discourse. So that's a really important part of teaching history. It will help broaden any student at any age group, actually, their understanding of what history is. Um, secondly, uh, clearly, it's an important tool, part of a toolkit uh, in modern cosmopolitan countries in terms of decolonizing uh, awarenesses of national identities and national histories. The, uh, certainly when I was growing up uh, in the 80s, uh, I think I was still largely given a historical narrative based around this kind of our island story narrative. Uh, and essentially, a detailed understanding of African history and, its, and, and a detailed understanding of a, a particular regional place in Africa really shows the enormous complexity of that history, uh, the way in which peoples in many different parts of Africa interacted and shaped uh, things we take for granted in modernity. And therefore, this teaching is very important in, the, in shaping a different sense of national identities and histories, which is fundamental in the 21st century in, in, in the world we now inhabit. Um, and, we, and doing that also, of course, means that we have to recognize that traditional national narratives, which are embedded in traditional history syllabi, uh, exclude large parts of, of, of the British nation today. And, and that actually a shared future requires empathy and understanding with the pasts of all those who, who form that nation today. Now, this still remains a problem, as I'm sure many of you know. Uh, particularly, actually, it's interesting to be doing this with Trevor, because I would say that Britain is, is, is really quite a long way behind, certainly in university teaching. Uh, in terms of a broad sense of world history. World history in, in, in this country is often still taught in, in, in universities uh, in, the, in a kind of imperial history in disguise way. And, and that stat shows some of the differences there. And the, and the importance here, as some of you will have come across the Royal Historical Society's report on race and ethnicity, which really shows how important it is to teach African history in order to bring new historians more representative of, of, of Britain, in this case, uh, into the classroom. Um, so what is the panorama for teaching African history in British schools? Well, a lot of you will be thinking of teaching it at key stage three. And you'll know, and, and of course, you know that, you know, schools are required to study wider world history at key stage three. So uh, just for, for Trevor, that means people from 11 to 14, uh, more or less. Uh, and um, this is often, in, when Africa has been taught in, in, in this context, it's often involved the transatlantic slave trade. Uh, and actually, I think this is an important difference, actually, in the panorama in Britain and the US, that in the Britain, of, I think really the panorama of teaching African history was fundamentally transformed by 2007, the bicentenary of the, of the abolition act of the transatlantic slave trade in the British parliament, all the commemorations around that, and then, there was a sense at that point that African history, and of course, this was a sense which built out of the whole history of abolition back to the 18th century. And I, I mentioned this in my book, This for the Shells, that African history was impossible to separate from the transatlantic slave trade. You couldn't teach African history without the transatlantic slave trade. They were almost symbiotically connected. Uh, and there was, and, and there's been, I would say, a big reaction to that in this country, uh, uh, in the historical profession, and also uh, in diaspora communities. Uh, and, and, and I think, since then, new resources, new approaches mean that you know now we should and can and will be teaching materials based around one kingdom or region, such as Benin or Congo, which we're going to talk about today. And that starting from the inside, from the daily life and daily experience of people, and moving out will give us a different perspective to starting from the outside, which we might see as, the, as starting with the slave trade would do, and then moving from that in. And, and so that's, I think, one of the fundamental changes which has certainly happened in the, in the, in the historical panorama in this country. So you've got Key Stage 3, and then you can teach it at Key Stage 5. Uh, now, I've been involved, some of you may know, uh, with uh, an option at the A-level uh, with the OCR Assessment Board uh, on pre-colonial African history, uh, which is uh, the option called African Kingdoms from 1400 to 1800. So this is the foreign study option uh, 
in the OCR assessment. It's one of them that you can take alongside the, you know, the more well-known examples like uh, well, the famous examples, Germany, um, civil rights era and so on. So just to switch to a, a web tab. So we have, a, there is a website for uh, that resource, which is here. And it is, um, this is africankingdoms.co.uk, has an introduction. Now this was, this resource, th 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 this website was designed for the A-level option. However, it certainly has a lot of material which would be useful for King Stage 3. It has a brief description of the main kingdoms which are covered, which are Benin, the Homi and Oyo, uh, in what's now Yoruba-speaking area of Nigeria, in the case of Oyo, and the Homi was in the Republic of Benin. Uh, Congo, which we're going to talk about today, and Songhai, which also covers uh, the ancient kingdom of Mali. You have a scheme of work from one of the teachers who's taught um, this resource. And then we have resource mention of exhibitions, electronic resources. There's the ebook, which I wrote for to accompany uh, this, um, this option. And, and if we just click on that, um, uh there's a if you download the book which you can do here um you'll find that there is a whole chapter on each of those kingdoms which which although it's aimed at a level students i think would certainly not be a, uh above students in year eight or year nine to, to have a look at and then some recommendations uh people to people like paul reed uh, the black cultural archives and uh also cambridge university Michigan institute for those of you who are thinking about uh, the destinations of your um of your students so those are the options really in, in the panorama uh, and clearly African history can be taught um, uh, in aspects of the imperial uh, parts of some of the GCC options but it's obviously not a major focus of that so the main areas where some of the material we're going to be covering today can be looked at are really in key stage three and key stage five so I've just got here I mean you, for more resources you can go on to um, for example the African Kingdom's electronic resources tab and have a look there I've just put up a, couple, a few others here which are worth looking at so we'll just go through those quickly. Now here is the African Online Digital Library, which is hosted at Michigan State University. Uh, and it's got a huge amount of material, really. I mean, it's impossible for us today to look through everything we've got here, but you can look through some of the things that you have there from oral narratives, slave biographies, forgotten voices in the present, uh, through to modern contemporary issues. Um, you can see there's a huge range of material there. Uh, a lot of it is recorded, sound archive, but there is all, there are also there are also print and photo archive. So that's really an excellent resource um, to to look at. Those of you who may be wanting to consider teaching aspects of the slave trade, a fundamental resource is this website, um, slavevoyages.org, which is a huge project, probably one of the bigger research research projects, which academic research projects in history, which has taken place in the world in the last twenty or thirty years. Uh, involving researchers from all around the world, uh, uh, looking at archives um, in many different countries. Uh, again, we haven't really got time to um, to go through every aspect of, of this website today, but if you just have a look at the site, you can see uh, some of the options, of, of some of the things that you can look at. You can look at the transatlantic slave trade, and here you can have, there's tabs on understanding the database, there are estimates, there are essays, there are maps, uh, and also there's a resources, there are lesson plans. So clearly, if anybody's considering um, teaching aspects more focused on the slave trade, that's a, a very good look, a sort of site to look at. Now, this is a web, th these are now, some of you may know that Zainab Badawi has just uh, released uh, her new uh, series on the history of Africa, which is built around the enormous project, which was the UNESCO, General History of Africa. Now, the UNESCO General History of Africa is, as I said, was an enormous project, uh, which was uh, mainly put together in the 50s, 60s, and 70s by teams of African historians. Um, it's the books are vast in every description, thousands and thousands of pages. They're not for uh, they're not for many people actually, but in, in the sense of they're very long and thick and dense. Um, they have a huge amount of information. Uh, and now they are now the Brazilian government under under President Lula funded uh, a rebooting of that project and also and the production of resources aimed more tailored more to the classroom, uh, which should be being published this year. Uh, 
uh, and we also see that the, the, these programs are all available now on YouTube. 15 of the 20 programs which they know Darby has made are now available on YouTube. So that's obviously a very good resource. And then the final resource I was just going to share with you, uh, which is definitely worth looking at, is, is was made about 10 years ago by Gus Casey Hayford, who many of you will know now, director of the Museum of African Art in uh, Smithsonian in Washington. Uh, his series of Lost Kingdoms of Africa. So there really are, you know, taking in the round, I would say, a lot of resources to start from there. On the African Kingdoms resource, you've got some tailored to uh, the British education system, including a scheme of work. And then more broadly, there are lots of different resources you can look at really to um, to start to think about putting putting lessons together. Um, so uh, moving on to the second part of, the, of, the, of my presentation, which is going to be really focused around the question of sources and discourses and how uh, African history, the sources which are used to put together uh, histories of Africa lead to a very different type of discourse to uh, to the ones that we might but that we are used to and familiar with from more European history. So the bottom point here, I think, is the fundamental one. I mean, tra traditionally historians of West Africa often used almost exclusively European textual sources. And if you're going to use those sources, you would end up believing that only the history of slavery, African European relations, um, really matter to pre-colonial West African history. However, if you look at oral sources, uh, those point to something quite different. They will point to the importance of kingship, migration, religion, commerce, and they often will not mention slavery hardly at all, even, or only tangentially. So there's, it's, it's a bit like the modern, or what we think is a modern phenomenon, but that this would suggest is not of the echo chamber, um, that the sources that you use will shape discourse if you own use those European sources you will end up exclusively associating uh, the African distant African past with slavery because that's what those sources will tell you uh, and that's why we have to go beyond those sources so this is an example this is a photograph I took at uh, Cape Coast Castle in Ghana a, few, a couple of years ago uh, and you can see the red tiled roof um, there now this was the capital of English slave trading operations in, in the Gold Coast for almost 200 years uh, now that that, that tiled roof was the chapel and above, and the and the arched doorway underneath is um, the doorway down into the dungeon where uh, the slaves were kept oh, for for long periods of time. Before they were marched along the corridor to the left under the cannons, it's an absolutely disgusting sight. Uh, Cape Coast Castle. I felt physically sick when I left it. If you read 18th century uh, English sources about it, however. You'll be described, you'll be reading descriptions of the beauty of the governor's apartments, the good appointment of the gardens, um, the well ordered uh, structure of the soldiers. Uh, and you will not sometimes read any mention of the slave trade at all, which clearly exemplifies the problem of using European sources that actually, for all that written sources are supposed to be objective, these sources leave out a huge part of the relevant history. That's why we have to think about other kinds of sources for thinking about shaping different discourses and different narratives of the African past. Um, so this is another photograph I took in uh, in Bintang in the Gambia. Bintang was an important uh, trading post uh, uh, settled from well, really started to become important from the late uh, mid fifth mid sixteenth late sixteenth century onwards on uh, this tributary of the Gambia River. You can see there um, re remains of uh, one of the settled, one of the trading posts there in Bintang, uh, and if you go to that place today, uh, and as I did a couple of years ago, and talk to um, some of the people who live there, they'll, they'll you know that in the houses are built with some of the stones which used to build these settlements. There are there are gravestones, there are headstones, so they haven't it hasn't been properly excavated. And West Africa is littered with um, sites like this. Further up the Gambia River, you get to uh, Cantora near to the edge of uh, the border between Gambia and, the, and Senegal. And uh, at that, the Cantora was a site where the trans-Saharan trades and the transatlantic trades met. Uh, traders came from both across the Sahara and from the Atlantic coast to, 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 to trade there. Uh, it's never been excavated. It's well known, uh, people in the, uh, historians, archaeologists in the Gambia know where it is, but it's never been excavated. And, there, and this is largely to do with problems of funding and ongoing crises in the university sectors in Africa. But just to say that there are many of these remains which can help to construct a really very important 
view of the materiality of the past. And finally, this is um, a church in Freetown. It's the St. John's Church, uh, which is the Maroon Church uh, in Freetown. Um, the Maroons, as most of you will know, were uh, people who'd been uh, transported in captivity and slavery to the Americas and had escaped and formed their own communities uh, and across the Americas from Brazil uh, to Jamaica to Cuba. Now, in the early 19th century, uh, many of them, some of them, uh, went to Freetown, uh, which was a port recently established by the English in what became Sierra Leone, uh, and they formed their own communities. And you can see there, that's their flag outside the church. And uh, uh, I have a, it's, um, it's a maroon flag. It has a picture of a ship. And if you go inside the church, you'll find that the the, the, the rafters are actually made with raft with, with beams from slave ships which were broken on the shore in Freetown, and they've been painted red. Now, why is this all important? Well, red is a very important symbolic country, color in this part of Africa. Red uh, caps are worn by uh, rulers in, of many different peoples. Uh, and when I was shown around this church a few years ago, the verger who showed me around was wearing a red baseball cap. And I, I noticed this and I, put, I said, oh, you're wearing a red cap. And he laughed because he, was, he, was, he, he saw that I'd recognized its symbolic importance. And this is to say that here's a story which takes us from West Africa the importance of the colour to the new world, which is returned, remains important and returns to West Africa 200 years later. So here's a story within that, through oral and symbolic sources, we see the globalism of Africa over a long period of time and the importance of African ideas of rulership and kinship and authority, not only in West Africa, but also in the new world. So these kinds of sources are very important in shaping different narratives. And, the, and I think what I'm just going to go through now is that actually there are lots of sources, visual sources out there, which you can use to populate your classes, whatever you're teaching, whether you're teaching Congo, we'll come on to that in a minute. But if you're teaching, for example, one of the questions which came in was about Mansa Musa. Uh, and this is a map which many of you may have come across. It's probably the most, one of the most famous uh, sources, visual sources that exist for uh, uh, medieval West Africa. It's the Catalan Atlas from 1375. It shows us uh, Mansa Musa with a holding a gold holding a gold nugget, the Emperor of Mali. It, it, its very existence tells us, in fact, of the globalism of West Africa before the quotes Portuguese voyages of discovery, uh, the connections that West Africa had, both North Africa and, in fact, Tiberia and places like Sicily and uh, the and what became the Ottoman Empire. Um, and so, visual sources. There are also there are visual sources which you can use for Songhai as well, which uh, Arabic manuscripts, for example. There are many of those available. Here is a different region. Uh, this is from around 1600. These are uh, ivories from the Sierra Leone region, from the Sapi uh, peoples, which actually were traded to Portugal from the late 15th century into the 16th century. They're often portraying religious um, uh, iconography, as in this case. You can see the cross. Uh, but sometimes also, and also sometimes actually influencing uh, Portuguese architecture. So, for example, you'll see the motif of the rope. Uh, the historian Francisco Betancourt has noted that the same motif of the rope exists in uh, the Manueline architecture of Portugal of the 16th century and actually suggests it was influenced by the sappy ivories which were traded from West Sierra Leone to Portugal. The rope being, of course, a very important part of the cordage of the ships uh, on which Portuguese navigators arrived. Uh, and this is a representation of a Portuguese trader from the Benin Bronze, it's perhaps more famous, uh, the long hair, uh, the sword. Uh, and they, so representations of all kinds exist from this distance period, which really can be very um, used very importantly to, to shape a different perspective on, on, on this distance African past. Okay, now from the question of sources, I'm gonna move on to conceptual framing. I'm, I'm not doing very well with time, but I'm still going to try and finish if I can by 4.45. Uh, so aspects of conceptual framing of how to approach thinking about this distant past and the question of African sovereignty. And this has been um, recently uh, discussed in an important uh, academic book by uh, an American professor, Herman Bennett. Um, and there are many examples of African sovereignty. And the reason that this is important is because the traditional view of the African past is, is somehow um, not one in which African rulers as sovereign equals of European rulers is conceived. The map we've already seen of Mansa Musa, the Catalan Atlas, the representation of Mansa Musa, if we just flip back to it, 
we see that uh, in an era where, in that era, the representation is of a royal dignitary as one might expect any royal dignitary really uh, to be represented at that time. Uh, in fact, in this early period, so if you go to the late 15th century, John II of Portugal sent many different ambassadors to rulers of different African kingdoms, to Benin, to the Kingdom of Congo, to Mandi Mansa, the uh, Emperor of Mali. Uh, and at the same time, you actually also had ambassadors from different parts of West Africa coming to Europe, from the uh, 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 royal family of, of, the, of Wolof in Senegambia, Bumi Jelen, who came to uh, Portugal in 1484, from the Kingdom of Benin, from Congo coming. So you actually have these diplomatic exchanges, and that's what they were. And you also have this continuing, actually, through longer periods of, of the West African past, from Alada in the 1650s to Spain, and five embassies from uh, Dahomey to Brazil and to Portugal in the later 18th century, but that's later than what we're talking about here. But the fundamental thing is this bottom point, that African rulers are, in this period, initially seen as equals with sovereign power. And pejoratives, and that you can see that in representations, I think, of Mansa Musa, and that the pejorative stereotypes related to Africans and race developed alongside the transatlantic slave trade as it grew, which is why it's very important both to be aware of that, but also why it is also important to focus on this early period. This brings us, of course, to Africa's historical relationship to Europe and the violence uh, which has gone with that, uh, and, the, and the violence has gone with the justification of that violence through the development of ideas belittling African societies and their achievements. And of course, the consequence of all of that has been uh, to speak far too generally about Africa. And as the Congolese philosopher Mouyin Bey reminds us in his book, The Invention of Africa, actually the continent of Africa is itself a Western invention emerging in the 18th century alongside the racist ideas of the Enlightenment. I sometimes ask my students, you know, if you're somebody from Senegambia in 1450, do you have more in common with somebody from Portugal or somebody from the Kingdom of Congo? Well, the answer is probably in a way Portugal because the Trans-Saharan trade connects you, as we've seen, to the northern to the Mediterranean and to Iberia. Uh, there's actually a shared language. People in Portugal speak Arabic, people in Senegambia speak Arabic. So that's a way of understanding more about this significance of this idea of the invention of Africa. And that essentialization of Africa and actually, of course, of Europe uh, has meant that outsiders writing about the continent have been far too ready to lump very different peoples together. And that's most apparent, I think, through the lens of slavery. And this second point here is very important. It's often said Africans sold Africans into slavery, but that actually completely misunderstands pre-colonial Africa, because as I've just said, people didn't see themselves as African. They saw themselves as uh, from Benin, from Dahomey, from Congo, from Oyo or Songhai as worshipping particular shrines, which people uh, from dis different uh, regions would not be worshipping. And so they didn't see those sold into slavery as African, but people of a particular background who had certain kin connections, certain religious beliefs and a particular status in that particular society. So the history of, so that's a very fundamental point, I think. And that's why I think it's important if we're teaching Western African history before 1600, perhaps to focus in on one example or, or at most two to, to emphasize that. Uh, so fun, the fundamental part of this conceptual framing is the history of pre-colonial West Africa is not the same as the thing as the history of slavery. And there are many other facets of pre-colonial West African history and achievements, which we have to foreshadow. Uh, Having said that, often it will be hard to avoid this question in the classroom because you'll be asked questions about it and some of the things you may teach may come to touch on it. So it's important to have an understanding of that. Um, most of the captives in the transatlantic slave trade uh, emerged through a complex process of trade and dependency. As the slave trade grew, so did the economic dependency of uh, West African kingdoms on it uh, for power and wealth. And so the impact, and this is one of the arguments in my book, A Fistful of Shells, the impact of the Atlantic slave trade on West African societies was one which contributed to economic divergence from the growing capital surpluses accumulating in Europe. But at the same time, focusing too hard on this subject runs the risk of portraying Africans solely as a victim in the historical process and ignoring the many achievements of West African societies, which students should have the chance to study on the course you can teach them. So that brings us to Congo. So, um, so we've covered their the panorama for teaching in British education, um, the question of sources and, and, and what, how the sources which we might use for this in the African past shape um, to type, a, a type of discourse, which is very important, and, and then how to think conceptually into 
the way ways to teach uh, the distant African past. And so finally, we're going to talk. We're going to give an example here. And I was actually going to do Benin, but I think one of the questions that came up here was that people always, uh, usually, uh, will teach um, the history of Benin. Uh, when they're teaching African history. So I thought, so Trevor and I were talking yesterday, we thought it'd be good to have a, a focus on something very different, so a different region. So we're gonna focus on Congo because there's actually a lot of material and resources uh, we can use to teach the history of the Kingdom of Congo. So this is a Congo a triple crucifix from Congo in the uh, from the 17th century. Congo uh, was the first kingdom in West Africa to convert to Christianity or whose elites converted to Christianity in the late 15th century. Um, so it had a long history of evangelization and Christianization. It was also a globally connected kingdom from that time uh, with uh, ambassadors in Portugal, in the Vatican, and at later points in places like Brazil uh, and in the Netherlands. So it's part of the geopolitical map of the Western hemisphere in the 16th and 17th centuries. And so it's a very important example of, of, an, of a significant West African kingdom. It's also got some beautiful visual resources you can use in your teaching, not only the many examples of Christian architect, of Christian iconography, that, like the one we just saw. Uh, indigenous uh, cloth weaving was a very important, one of the main industries, the, the main industry, in fact, really, in the Kingdom of Congo. Um, so on the, on the right, we have a raffia cloth from uh, Ku, the Kuba region of, of Congo, which were exported for a long period of time. On the left, the Mbu, which was the, the, the equivalent of the crown, if you like, of, of, of the of, uh, Mani Congo, the ruler of Congo. And there are many similar examples uh, which have survived, um, which you can look at and think about in terms of, and they're very important, I think, for thinking into daily life. What were what were the daily activities of people and, and weaving was an important part of them. There are also other visual sources uh, that you can use. This is a famous painting, uh, which some of you may have come across. It's, it's in my book uh, of uh, Don Miguel de Castro who was ambassador of the Kingdom of Congo to the Dutch court in Brazil in the 1640s. Uh, and, there are, uh, it was, uh, and there are other paintings of his, um, uh, of his, of his uh, ambassadors, of his envoys who came with him, his pages. Uh, and I think that these, are, these representations are very important in, in again, in, in showing that the representation of African rulers and ambassadors and dignitaries at this time was not necessarily one which became, was reductively associated with racial stereotypes which followed later. Now this is important as an example because the Dutch had only really started trading in, in, in slavery in 1630, so this portrait 13 years afterwards or thereabouts, although they were heavily involved in it by this time in Brazil, many of the people who'd grown up in the Netherlands before that wouldn't have grown up with those stereotypes. So this is perhaps the last moment really in this Atlantic era when, when such a representation might have been possible. Congo art also gives us uh, important insights into how the experience of power and of globalization, uh, how, that, how that process was experienced in, in the region of West Central Africa. Now, these power figures were made largely in the 19th century uh, in regions of, what, of the Kingdom of Congo, which by that time had fragmented. Uh, and I think they are very symbolically powerful of the enormous violence which went with the process of globalization in Congo in the, in the, in the intervening centuries from the previous painting. Just going to finish, I think, with a, with a brief overview of Congo history, and then that, hopefully that will, will, will set us up nicely for, for, for Trevor's, uh, for Trevor's uh, what lessons and thoughts on how to teach Congo history, uh, which we're going to move on to next. Um, so it's probably emerged as a as a polity in the late 14th century. It's actually located in what's today northern Angola. Uh, its capital was Mbansa, Congo, which was founded by around 1400. It was at a confluence of trade routes, and there were about 30,000 people living there by the middle of the 15th century. So the Portuguese arrive in 1482, uh, and the and the, the Mani Congo Nzingaku accepts baptism uh, two years later. On his death, there's a civil war between pro and anti-Christian pretenders to the throne, and the Christian candidate that's Alfonso I, uh, his, his faction wins, and he became Mani Congo in 1509. Um, and one of the things about uh, Christianity in Congo was that it challenged the fundamental building block of uh, Congo society, which was the kanda, the lineage, uh, rules about marriage uh, and residence fundamentally were contrary to the kanda. 
Uh, and some historians actually think that, that that contradiction was at the root of why the Kingdom of Congo ultimately collapsed in the middle of the 17th century. You then had a, uh, complex relationships through the middle part of the 16th century between Congo kings and the Portuguese and missionaries such as the Jesuits, uh, and a, re a reaction to the growing proximity of Congo kings to the Portuguese in an invasion of people who the Portuguese knew as the Jaga, uh, who dethroned Alvaro I in 1568, and some historians think that was largely to do with uh, inequalities driven by the rise of the slave trade. Uh, the Portuguese, it was, who helped Alvaro I back to the throne, and thereafter the Congo kings in the latter part of the 16th century were very closely uh, connected and in some ways more and more dependent on the Portuguese. And in 1575, as a result of that, the Portuguese formed Luanda, of course, which is today the capital of Angola. Uh, Luanda was, a, was, was, in fact, that was a very important moment um, because, as I write in my book, Luanda was actually the Bank of Congo, the shell money uh, equivalent to the cowries, which were the currency of Congo, were actually fished in Luanda. So the Portuguese had essentially captured that bank, and this triggered a series of growing conflicts, both with Nongo, which was the nearest uh, kingdom to Luanda, and with Congo. Congo were more and more angry about the Portuguese role and presence, and so they began sending out feelers to the Dutch in the early 17th century. There were various wars between the Congo and the Portuguese, and more closer and closer alliance between Congo and the Dutch which culminated in the 1640s with uh, the Dutch seizing Luanda and Sao Tome from the Portuguese. But eventually they were defeated uh, by a fleet sent from Brazil uh, in 1648, and Congo was forced to accept harsh peace terms with the Portuguese. And the 1650s saw greater encro in, in encroachments on Congo rights. Uh, Brazilian governments repeated the harsh policies they'd enacted against Native American populations in Brazil. And in 1665, the Congolese army um, was largely destroyed at the Battle of Wheeler, and a civil war began in Congo. So, coming towards conclusion, uh, why Congo is a is a good example because we have a diversity of visual sources and written sources written by Congo kings and Congo kings from an early time. Uh, it's a clear evidence of a powerful kingdom in this part of Africa, which predates European arrival and was a global geopolitical actor in the 16th and 17th century. Also, it's very significant in the history of the slave trade. If you go onto the Slave Voyages website, you'll see that 45% of Africans captured in the transatlantic slave trade and, and who crossed the Atlantic came from this region of West Central Africa. Uh, and you can also trace the impact of that trade on a, what was a strong kingdom, which then declined and collapsed in the civil war in the later 17th century. Uh, finally, two minutes left, almost there. Some resources, we have uh, this wonderful exhibition, which some of you may have heard of a few years ago at the Metropolitan Museum in New York, which still has um, good resources available on its website. Uh, the American historian, John Thornton, uh, who is one of the preeminent historians of Congo, uh, has created this site with um, transcriptions and translations of one of the key sources on on uh, this region, uh, Kavasi, which is uh, not a short book. It's got uh, 670 pages originally, so um, there's a lot there for you to get immersed in. Uh, for a shorter precy, uh, not of Kavatsi's length, uh, you can look at the chapter on Congo in the A-level textbook I wrote, and you can also look on the Slave Voyages website for assessments and estimates of the, of the impact of the slave trade. So there's plenty of digital resources to work with. And I'm going to finish with a brief bibliography here uh, with, for, for broader reading on Congo, if you, if you, if you want to uh, take that further. Cecile Fromont's book on the art of convention is a wonderful book which looks at uh, Christ, uh, different types of art produced in Congo. It's, got, it's heavily illustrated, so it really is a good book to, to work with. Uh, and then Anne Hilton's Kingdom of Congo is still one of the best overviews. The religious aspects are looked at by Wyatt McGaffrey excellently. Haywood and Thornton look at uh, this part of Africa's place in the Atlantic slave trade and in the Atlantic uh, African diaspora to the Americas in the early 17th century. Uh, and Miller's Kings and Kinsmen is still a wonderful example of oral history and the way it can be used to, to think about the distant past. And it's 4.45 and there are just some final thoughts uh, about teaching possibilities, but I know Trevor's going to take uh, that a lot further. So it's over to you, Trevor. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Toby. Um, so I'm not sure if I'm in command 
uh, yet. I think somebody has to give me command. I think uh, they do. Oh, I can go to. I'm in command there, but I haven't turned on my video, I think. There I am uh, on video. And hopefully my ability to share uh, my screen will soon come over as well. Um, I'm not sure if you can see my screen. I think you can actually. Uh, I'm going to ask you uh, for a few favors. Uh, the first is that you feel free to use the question area um, I'm going to monitor that for questions, and I, um, I really uh, suggest that you break in uh, if you feel like it and, and ask a question. Uh, also, please excuse my colonial accent um, and any delay that might be happening. Uh, I'm not only in the States, but I'm 3,000 miles uh, west of the East Coast, so there might be a short delay. I'm a historian of Africa, um, but history education uh, is my main area uh, of emphasis these days. Um, I may use terms that aren't that familiar to you. Um, again, so please uh, ask questions. I know we, we use slightly different terms uh, on either side of the Atlantic, um, uh, including spelling inquiry or inquiry uh, different ways. Um, but I am going to be talking about inquiry-based education. And what I'm going to be giving you essentially, I hope, is a lesson plan to spend uh, a few days on the Congo um, and uh, I work with the World History Project uh, quite a lot, uh, as I believe uh, Toby mentioned or, or Nick mentioned. Um, if I were to uh, just suggest to you that you should feel free to take a look at the World History Project uh, if you feel like it. Um, you do have to put in your name uh, and, and email address, but otherwise it's all free resources for you. And I just wanted to point to, for example, um, Everything that's here is downloadable or available. Um, there are some videos here if you're teaching West Africa that I think are important, uh, including this video that we made in Ghana uh, using mainly female Ghanaian historians uh, as our guide. Uh, this one is on the Atlantic slave trade. There are a number of others. Those are all free, available to you. They have lesson plans around them. Um, but we're focusing, of course, today largely on uh, the Congo. Um, and so I'm going to be turning to talking about the Congo. Um, I do want to say that everything that I'm going to talk about today, um, I have provided the original scholarly sources uh, from which the lesson plan is derived. Um, some of those sources, as Nick said, are attached as handouts. Uh, others will be coming um, to you or available to you. Those are for you to read. And many of them deal with source types that are uh, unusual to students, as you'll see graphic text, visual sources, um, and they may help you to put together uh, your lesson plan. Um, when I work with teachers here, usually it's what we call 10th grade, which is uh, 14 or 15 year olds. And we do build a lot around the idea of giving a sort of mini lecture at the beginning to introduce students to the material and then doing a lot of active learning. Um, and if I were to build a lecture on Congo, um, I would build it directly out of Toby's material here, this A-level History A uh, book. Um, if you go to page sort of 18 uh, here, uh, you get into Congo. Uh, let's see, where are we here? And the Kingdom of Congo. And you get, I think, really an excellent narrative um, to help develop what are the main themes in the development of the state of Congo. Now, not only do you uh, make a choice when you're talking about Congo, but um, I'm suggesting that you make a choice uh, in focusing what you're going to do around Congo. Um, there are some wonderful sources out there dealing with the Atlantic slave trade specifically, but the lesson plan that I'm developing here uh, and that I'm gonna share with you, this plan of work uh, focuses on trying to understand the kingdom and society of Congo uh, as an independent state <clears throat> um, and trying to understand how its society functioned, um, the inquiry question then is what was the society of uh, Congo like prior to the era of the Atlantic slave trade uh, and understanding its values and understanding its political system 
and doing so using a variety of evidence. So we give the students evidence. Um, and a little bit uh, of that evidence in the beginning is uh, secondary source evidence that really aligns with the way that Toby has um, worked on and John Thornton and, and, and others have worked on uh, Congo and its history. But it includes some oral tradition materials, uh, things like proverbs. Um, it includes uh, graphic writing, which is really interesting to look at and think about. Uh, it includes power figures, as we're going to see, those in Kisi or, or Minkisi that uh, Toby also showed. Uh, here's a quick map establishing where the Kingdom of, of Congo uh, is located in West Central Africa. So to begin with, then, students read um, a brief explanation that's um, actually a synopsis that I put together from uh, work that Toby and others did about the Kanda system, which is the key political system, um, we think, for the way that uh, Congo was run. And again, behind this, and, and you'll see some of the, the secondary sources that we, we use to, to develop this, behind this is a lot of research, uh, and a lot of that research is based in oral tradition work or historical linguistics work, looking at how words change over time. I didn't include that particular work um, in this packet, it is really complex to understand without understanding the entire way that languages are structured. And um, I haven't seen that be used successfully in secondary education, although perhaps it could be. Um, but so the Kanda system is the central sort of political system of the, 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 the Congo state. Um, and here what we're doing in part is we're, we're not using the word tribe or we're not even really using the word clan. These are words that are typically uh, applied um, by students and by general society in the West to these communities. Um, we're really giving a sense, a, a sense of, of, of how the system works and how it changed over time. Um, and the way that we think it worked is that essentially this is a society that started out um, with uh, the basic unit of organization being these matrilineal descent groups. You belonged to your mother's uh, kanda. Um, now, it's actually a little bit more complex than that. Um, and, and it was designed so that a person had obligation to and could call on both their own kanda um, and that came from their mother and their father's kanda and their grandfather's, uh, et cetera. Um, but we're gonna try to keep it kind of simple there. And we're going to say that, that, that we think that Kanda largely uh, emerged um, so that uh, uh, land could be assigned to people um, to work in a way that was sort of equitable and locally controlled. Um, and, and, you know, land control, um, the ability to farm was really important to the society as it began to become quite densely populated. Um, and that Kanda really are quite diverse. So in some cases, we get these very uh, we think we get these very hierarchical kanda um, in which you have uh, really powerful centralized chiefs. Um, on the other hand, we have kanda that seem to be much more sort of egalitarian, you could say democratic in decision making. And then we have to deal with the existence of slavery here, but we have to do so in a way that kind of complexifies uh, a little bit what students understand about slaves. So. Um, by and large, to be, in, to be in a category that might be analogous to slave in the society um, was to not belong, in essence. If you don't have a kanda, you are without a kanda. So it didn't necessarily have to do with labor. It wasn't necessarily, um, it, it certainly wasn't racialized. Um, it wasn't necessarily permanent. In fact, um, many people could then become assimilated into a kanda. The kanda had, had an incentive to get more people in, uh, if possible. Um, but certainly these are people who have junior status, if you will, in society. So how does the kingdom of, of Congo form? Uh, we're gonna see different accounts when we get to the next section on oral tradition. But what we really think, and here's the first evidence that students have, is that 12 of these kanda came together to form a confederation. Um, so that's what Congo was essentially. Um, and this confederation decided that they would be allied together. Um, the confederation was there partly to be able to exploit uh, and make war on other Kanda uh, around them. Um, and they formed this sort of central 
core of a new state. And they said only the members of these 12 Kanda can decide who the, the king or the Mani Congo is. Um, and you may wonder how is the Mani Congo selected? Um, I'm actually not sure, but maybe if, if anybody wants to know that, Toby can come in later and tell us some of this um, additional stuff. Um, and so <clears throat> this Kanda then, these, these 12 Kanda that form the center of the king, the kingdom of Congo, <clears throat> that helps uh, select the king, the Mani Congo, um, also serve as a sort of council. They actually become essentially an elite class. And I think that that's the, the better way to understand that, uh, that Mwisi Congo is, is they are this sort of elite class within the kingdom. Um, and they generally then help uh, and exert power on and influence on the king, the Mani Congo. But over time, the political system of the kingdom does change. Uh, as we see in many societies, as happened in England, uh, of course, the king gets his own household um, or court, and those people um, become loyal to him and dependent on him rather than their own kanda. Um, and so we get some sort of uh, power differential between this original elite uh, and the king's household, between the aristocracy, the nobility, if you want, and the king's household. Um, so. You know, my hope is that all of this, if students were to work through this material and answer the questions down below, which are largely knowledge-based questions that are just sort of building their knowledge base in the beginning, um, can give them a sense uh, of um, some evidence about how this kingdom is formed and how its governance changes over time uh, as at a sort of basic level. So here in this first section, they're developing this basic framework. Um, <clears throat> and I imagine students working in groups um, to kind of come up with these uh, answers. Although, of course, I've given you a Microsoft Word document here so that you can change it however you want uh, and use whatever you want from it and ignore the rest. So what does oral tradition tell us? And here um, I'm going to uh, sort of present an idea that we have that Oral tradition, we don't use that as historians. We don't use it really to establish fact um, unless we can cross correlate it with other evidence. Um, oral tradition, instead, we tend to read, African historians tend to read it as messages from the past wrapped up in a story. Messages that are, are usually metaphors um, for explaining something rather than telling us what happened. But metaphors can be very useful for thinking about what a society is trying to tell you. Um, having said that, I include in here, and I, and I, I, I um, call upon you to share with students the idea that in the Congo Kingdom, as in many other kingdoms, and I'm gonna answer your question in a second, uh, Sally. In the Congo Kingdom, as in many other kingdoms, um, the, uh, there, there are professional rememberers. Um, they're professional historians, if you will, whose job it is to remember this material and who have all kinds of mnemonic devices to remember these things. So it's not like you and me playing a game of telephone. Um, let me just answer Sally, Sally Thorne's question, which I should have come to earlier, was the Manikongo always a king? You know, in this region, we have great examples of female leaders, um, but I do not know of a female leader um, who was Manikongo, um, when we get to the Civil War period, which I'm not covering here, we get an incredible female leader who becomes essentially the female leader of the state, but in a sort of uh, religious way uh, and only briefly and not as king. And her name is Beatrice Kimpavita um, or Beatrice of St. Anthony. Um, John Thornton has written a fabulous book on her um, and, and who she is and where she comes from. But unless Toby wants to chime in and correct me, I don't believe there was ever a female, uh, actual formal Manikongo. Um, and I'm not entirely sure what that is. You know, I work in Asante mainly and, and Fonti. I work, I work in, in, in what is today Ghana. And there we see um, women unable to play the sort of leadership role, role um, until they're postmenopausal. Uh, in, in, at which point they can play much stronger leadership role. But I wouldn't want to sort of apply these ideas to Congo when I don't really, when I don't really know. Um, Toby, if you have any idea, feel free to, to chime in uh, if you feel like it. 
Well, just to say that there, there were never female money Congos, but um, but yes, there were lots of female leaders in that region. Yes, right. I, I, you know, and 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 some of them quite famous, um, like Nzinga, um, not not too far away, um, but not female men of Congo. Um, and 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 by the way, what, what, that's quite that that's actually quite usual in 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 matrilineal societies. What 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 being matrilineal does change, and what it does do is it usually means that, and I believe in this case this is true as well. It usually means that um, the new king is not necessarily the son of the old king, but rather um, the new king is selected from within a group of candidates who are the descendants of the matrilineal group. Um, and you know, over time, often that merges into, uh, you know, by the 18th, 17th, 18th century, often that merges into more of a sort of descent from a, a father to a son. But under the older matrilineal system, um, the new king is a member. He, he inherits uh, uh, by dint of his being a member of the matrilineal group, not by, by dint of his being the son of the old Manicongo. Um, so, um, so and, and actually, this shows in the oral tradition about the the emergence of um, uh, Congo. So about this oral tradition, I do want to say really quickly that this isn't the oral tradition as it would be told um, by a professional. That would be much longer, much more complex, much too difficult for students to deal with. And so I have there's no footnote here because this is me um, parsing and reducing the oral tradition on the founding of the state. Um, which has this guy named Lukeni, uh, Lukeni Luanima as the first king and the founder of Congo. Um, and the oral tradition says this guy was actually the son of uh, a, a father in a kingdom far to the north. Um, and, um, but even though he was the son, he wasn't necessarily going to inherit. Um, and his father charged a toll to people who passed through the kingdom on the road. And one day he puts Lukeni in charge of the toll um, when Lukeni's aunt came, comes along, um, she says, well, I'm, I'm your aunt. I don't have to pay the toll. Um, he argues with her. He kills her uh, and her child. Um, but he isn't punished for this. Um, uh, but this is this really important um, uh, moment. And um, then he, uh, uh, when, he, when he grows older, uh, he takes his followers. He crosses the Congo River and he invades Congo. Um, Nathaniel, I see your question. I'm going to answer it because the next thing we're going to look at is, in fact, the Congolese written uh, language, if you will. So um, the answer is sort of yes, but but not in a, in a way that's as useful to us as historians as we would want. Um, but we'll get to written stuff. Um, absolutely. So. Um, sorry, let me just. Um, you know, and I also I see some raised hands. It's difficult for me to deal with raised hands so much as questions. So if you are raising a hand and you feel like you can um, use it as a question instead, please, please do so. Uh, put it up as a question. OK, so of course, historians, you know, look at this oral tradition and they say, well, hang on a second. Um, we don't actually believe that this guy, Lukeni Luanima, was an invader. Um, in fact, we think what he was is he was the ruler of one of these 12 Kanda that becomes part of this confederation. So the first question we ask is, why would he claim to be an invader? Um, and, you know, I give a little bit of information there, but I want students to start thinking about it. Um, what this does suggest, the story, um, is it suggests that um, they wanted to, later kings wanted to claim that their ancestor was an invader um, because that gave him a particular kind of power um, because he was a successful invader, he came from outside, um, he was meant to rule, he was meant to be this uh, ruling class, etc. Um, similarly, we can read the story of him killing his aunt, he probably didn't kill his aunt, um, as a metaphor. And again, what the metaphor says um, is here's a ruler who treats everyone equally, even his own relatives. I mean, it's a horrible story, but, you know, uh, there you go. Um, so, Jason, yes. Um, are there storytellers who convey these traditions? Yes, um, you know, I have not, I searched, I have not ever found this in English. I have not ever heard these in English. If you want, you know, these were sold as tapes, uh, literally as tapes. Um, I actually have a, a tape of, of, of uh, some of these oral traditions. Um, I've never been, converted it into anything other than a tape. Um, they were sold in sort of markets as tapes. 
Um, so I haven't been able to find versions that you can hear, uh, unfortunately. Um, for others, of course, you know, if you were to work on Molly, um, of course, there are um, great versions of sort of the epic of Sunjata, but for Congo, I've never found these, and uh, I don't know, um, I don't know where we would find them, unfortunately, because agreed, it would be great to hear that. Um, okay, so again, part of what we're trying to do here is get a sense of, of kingship and, and, and how the society thought about kingship. Um, next, we go to Proverbs. And, you know, in my little lesson plan here, I do try to explain Proverbs a little bit to suggest that, you know, what Proverbs tell us, again, is kind of some values that a society has. But we should also remember that not everybody agrees with a proverb necessarily, um, that Proverbs, you know, we have to read them sort of really kind of carefully. Um, and, um, but we have Proverbs. And, and again, so how old are these proverbs? You know, in some cases, we don't know that they go back beyond the 19th century. Um, we are using a shorthand here, I have to admit. We're not asking 12-year-olds to really, you know, do discourse analysis or historicization in the way that you might want to. You might tell these students that these are proverbs that are, we know today as modern proverbs. We cannot be sure just how far back they go. Um, we just can't. But what these proverbs do tell us is they give us some sense of um, some values in society because they were they were spread enough, they were shared enough um, to become very common in Congo today. Um, the first one, that which is known, which is out in the off uh, in the open, does not cause pain or bring torment to anyone. You know, this is a clear message that um, keeping secrets is dangerous, actually. Um, and students might think about that. And one of the questions that I asked down below is, would every society hold these as a value? Uh, or, or are these things that you think are particular to Congo? Um, this one is great. The rope we use to climb palm trees follows the footholds the ancestors made on the palm tree trunk. Well, first of all, climbing palm trees is important. Um, you get fruit, you get um, palm wine from palm trees. Um, uh, uh, but second, here's the idea that, um, you don't you, you don't achieve everything on your own. You achieve it because your ancestors have 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 set the path for you. And this certainly shows this value of um, not thinking about yourself as just an individual making individual achievements. Um, but it also shows the value of the ancestors and thinking about the ancestors. Um, and then two two birds disputed about a kernel when a third swooped down and carried it off. Um, you know, uh, fighting is not productive. Um, you know, you can both lose, right? It can be a lose-lose situation. Learn to get along with each other. So here's a society that is valuing um, getting along with each other. Now, of course, the presence of these proverbs tells us that there were people who were breaking these rules as well, right? There's no need for a proverb about don't fight uh, if people aren't fighting. Um, so this shouldn't be used to suggest that this was sort of a perfectly peaceful society, quite the opposite. But it does say that this society valued these things. Um, and I've asked students to think about things like um, how they might describe, how they might create a proverb about their own youth culture and describe it to us. Um, but I really, I mean, of course, most of the questions focus on them understanding what these proverbs might mean. Okay, so to answer uh, Nathaniel's question, um, yes, there is a writing system. And one of the sources that I've made available to you is a chapter on the Congo writing system. Interestingly, most of the examples we have of this writing today do not come from Congo. They come from the two places where Kikongo speakers um, and, and people from the language community around them um, densely populated uh, in, the new, in the Americas, and that is from Cuba and Brazil, where they're still used in many cases. And boy, if you, if you want to read something fantastic and share it with your students, um, share the graphic novel um, uh, uh, Angola Janga by Marcelo de Salate, which is, was in Portuguese, it's now in, in English, um, which uses a lot of these symbols within, it, within sort of a comic book form. But the chapter that I've shared will give you a lot of these. Um, some of it is a little bit speculative, and I've stayed away from the speculative stuff. But... We have some graphic symbols here that again, um, 
give us messages that might tell us something about Congo society. So here's one that says welcome and spirituality. Um, and by the way, part of the reason that we don't have a lot of these, um, Nathaniel and others, is because they were probably generally written on cloth um, and that cloth is gone. That cloth did not survive for a variety of reasons. So what we have are the things that were done in lithic, that were, that were um, done in stone. Um, so here are these two symbols. Um, where there are adults, there are also children. I think that one's quite funny for students to work with. It may not be age appropriate. It's up to you to decide. Um, and then also um, uh, uh, others. Um, let, me, let me pause for a second before we go on to the last symbol, just to answer some questions. Um, so Oliver Morris, is it possible to re recommend a, a podcast essay or book on where racism emerged from? Um, I do have to think about that. I'm, I'm not sure. You know, Nick may be the person to answer uh, that question. Um, there, is, there is an excellent article um, that argues, that, that intervenes in the debate um, over whether um, European racism develops from the slave trade or contributes to the development of the slave trade um, that I could recommend. And um, I'm going to go, need to go and look it up when I have a second. Um, but certainly, certainly there, there's this debate about it. Certainly modern racism should not be normalized um, as necessarily. Um, most of the research that I've read on a world historical scale about this suggests that um, race uh, uh, is a modern invention. Um, the slave trade plays an important role in it. Uh, in many ways, but the feeling that people have an in-group and an out-group and some aversion to the out-group is something that is quite naturally human, but that is not the same as, as, as racism. Um, I'm not sure I can get into that too deeply today, but certainly if we have another, another um, day, we will think about that uh, and talk about it. Last piece of art I want to share with you, sorry, graphic writing that I want to share with you is the most complex um, rock art that we found um, in, 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 in Tari de Simba, Simbi, which is actually in northern Angola um, today, um, but well within the, the area of what was the Congo Kingdom. Um, we can't, at, oral tradition associates this with the Congo Kingdom. It may actually be associated with another nearby state. Um, it's a little, it's a little um, debatable, but um, certainly I think it's a useful uh, tool in this case. Um, it, it, it references uh, it, it references the sort of death of kings um, and their crossing over into another world. It's actually called the cosmogram, um, a type of writing that is sort of encompassing a worldview. The reason that it's important for us is that it gives a sense of what a king should be doing, um, at least according to the, the the interpretation by Robert Ferris Thompson, um, which suggests that it refers to a king being associated with good agriculture um, or growth. Um, and uh, also um, uh, with being very generous. So the idea that the king is there in part to redistribute, to, to be generous, not to accumulate wealth necessarily, um, but to redistribute it. Um, by the way, those of you, if you're looking at the questions, I think you should be able to see them. Jason Todd made a recommendation of uh, Bethencourt's History of Racism, um, and I uh, would suggest that that's uh, probably likely. Um, Nathaniel, I see, um, said that there's a podcast called Seeing White, uh, which is great. Um, Matthew, I'm gonna answer your question in a minute if that's okay. Um, so um, the penultimate source, or maybe it's the final source that I want to share with students is one of these, Mkisi, um, these power figures. And, you know, again, the, the timing on these is a little iffy because um, there, there, there's some evidence that they, that they existed. Certainly the idea of Minkisi, um, Capuchin monks sort of write about things like this a little bit uh, for earlier dates. But um, as Toby mentioned, they're really from, they really explode in sort of the 19th century and a later date. But they're also a great metaphor for talking about values. Um, because what, a, what an Nkisi really is, is, is it's, it's a protection figure in many ways. It's meant to um, 
is meant to protect you in a couple of ways. One of the most important is um, it protects you against greed. So if you are um, making a deal, if you will, um, you would both swear on the NKC, you would swear an oath. Um, so oathing is, is, is what it's actually called. Um, and then if you were to break it, you would be punished. Um, so again, these NKC, they are visual metaphors, right? Um, and I've listed here for students some of the things that they have. They have ropes that bind people together. They, they, they have these iron nails and steel blades that pierce the greedy. Um, they often have claws around them that would snatch someone who breaks a, a rule. They often have whistles to alert the community to danger. Um, and so again, you can ask students to think about what values do these suggest were important to society. They can also think about what problems do they suggest um, were present in society. Um, that had to be had to be solved. So the culmination here of what I'm suggesting essentially is that after you work with students on this material, you ask them um, what they've learned about Congo as a state. Now we haven't mentioned the slave trade, and for me, that's an entirely different lesson. For me, you can start getting there into things like Beatrice Kimpavita's Oath of Saint Anthony. Um, which uh, is a fantastic source for telling you about the damage caused by the Atlantic slave trade. Or there's a written source by King Afonso I um, that's widely available on, on the web, actually. It's one of the sources people use. That's great for understanding the slave trade. I haven't gone there. Um, and I don't think you can talk about the history of Congo without talking about the slave trade. But I've focused here on trying to understand or help students understand Congo from its own sources and from its own uh, perspective. Um, and that's, that's, that, that's what I hope to do. And I'm going to stop now um, in a second so we can have our own uh, questions, uh, uh, so we can have some time for questions if people have them uh, to come up. Let me just uh, try to uh, um, begin by answering Matthew's question and uh, invite Toby and, and, and Nick certainly to help out with that as well. Um, if students were to visit some sites, I think there are some great sites for students to visit that are really important. Um, one of these is Mapangabwe in, in South Africa. Um, if they wanted to try to understand um, pre-colonial Southern African societies, um, Great Zimbabwe as well uh, is, I think, a, a, a very important one. Um, in, 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 in West Africa, um, you know, if we're looking at this period, especially uh, Gore, um, Gore Island, I think, is particularly important. Um, uh, Jenne, uh, Jenna Jenna um, on Jenna the, on the on the Niger River um, has some pretty interesting stuff on Google Earth, uh, for example, that I, that I think is great. Um, let me let me invite back Nick and, and Toby uh, if they want to add anything uh, to anything I've said here, um, and and maybe we I'll, I'll keep looking for more questions as they emerge. So Nick, Toby, anything you'd like to add? I just briefly on places to visit uh, or see uh, um, with students. Uh, one in, in Congo, just focusing on Congo, I mean, Mbansa Congo is still quite, uh, the, the, the ruins of Mbansa Congo are still quite visible and have been restored in some way recently. Uh, and there's also Mbansa Congo, which was the capital of, of, of Congo. Uh, and a little further south, uh, um, in land from Luanda, you have Pedras Ndongo. Um, perhaps I'll write that in the chat, which which was uh, one of the main uh, political area capitals of the Kingdom of Ndongo. So those would be the two. I'll just write them in the chat. Yeah, and and Jason, yeah, you've got it. Angola Django by Marcelo de Salate. It's it's huge. There is he did do a shorter book as well. Um, just by the way, um, that's called Run for It, I think. Um, it's sort of a shorter version. It's much less. It's much less epic. And again, let me just be clear: these, these books are about Palmares. They're about the. They're about these communities in Brazil that um, escaped formerly enslaved people uh, built um, these quilombos, these independent communities um, that, for for a long time, managed to remain independent then of Portuguese Brazil. Um, the thing that um, is important and the reason that they're even mentioned here at all is that there's an there is an extensive and amazing continuity between um enslaved congolese 
uh, sorry, between Congolese society and these societies that emerge um, on the, in, 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 in northern Brazil um, and in Cuba. And there's even a lot of work that shows enormous and important continuities between Congolese society and the Haitian Revolution. Um, and that in fact suggests that um, the civil wars that result in so many people being enslaved in Congo um, and that, that bring a large Congolese population to Haiti you know, before, before, the, before that revolution and, and generations before help to create a framework for organization for rebellions that happen earlier than the Haitian Revolution and then ultimately probably for the Haitian Revolution as well. So that Atlantic connection in that case is very, very important. Oh my gosh, and there are a bunch more questions here. Oh, there are more um, questions. Um, you know, you may know the answer to this. I have no idea. Do Arab travelers turn up in Congo? Well, there's, I don't think there's much evidence of Arab travelers turning up in Congo. Well, there is evidence, and I think this is important, is that actually of Congo's connections to um, a broader a broader global world before the 15th century uh, through things like sugarcane in Congo when the Portuguese arrived, uh, uh, the, use of, the use of a cowrie currency uh, uh, or a shell currency, which suggests connections to the to the Indian Ocean and to um, and to sites in West Africa, which were also already using a cowrie currency. Uh, so Congo is this part of West of Africa has often been represented as somehow having been completely cut off from the world before the Portuguese arrived, and I think those that, that sort of evidence suggests that that's not true. Right, I'm just going to just come back on the, the racism part because um, I think the sites that Toby and Trevor have suggested are amazing. Um, there are a, a number of books, but I think just a few recent ones that uh, may help everybody, um, which is the uh, Adam Rutherford's uh, book, How to Argue with a Racist. Um, I think that's really interesting. I've got a review coming out on that uh, in a couple of weeks time, but it, it's, it really does boil down some of the arguments. Um, there is a history of white people uh, by Nell Irving Painter, uh, which is a, a a really interesting history uh, talking about how the idea of Caucasians and various other things have been created and I think that gives a real interesting counterpoint um, and one other book that I would recommend just off the top of my head is Ken Malik's The Meaning of Race. Um, I'll send around some of these uh, references but I think it's really important if we are talking about racism um, it's not a trans historical thing. Um, it changes in uh, over time and it depends on where we're talking about it as well. So uh, it's incredibly complex, and I'm just trying to give a very short answer, but those would be three things that I'd suggest you read. Um, I'm not going to show myself on the um, the webcast because every time I seem to do that, it always breaks down for me. So I'm being the disembodied voice from the outside. Um, there's one more question now. Is there evidence of trading between the different African kingdoms? I mean, there's, there's actually there's huge evidence of trading between the different African kingdoms. But here, here we're talking about, you know, I mean, Africa being so huge, um, where and what. So, you know, the one thing, the one thing I'd add is that, uh, or one thing that I'd add is that um, uh, Congolese cloth, bark cloth, um, was considered, you know, to be very high quality cloth uh, in several places. Um, there, there are even sort of proverbs about it uh, in in the Gold Coast, but 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 when was that? And and you know it, it, it's hard to know. Um, but but certainly we have uh, a great deal of evidence about um, pretty long distance trade, um, a lot of it along the coast. So so it depends where. And and let me just let me just give a few of the um, things to consider. You know, one of them is that um, domesticated animals don't do particularly well in West and West Central African forests in general um, because of tryptosomiasis, um, uh, sleeping sickness. And so um, trade uh, flourished, especially along rivers. Trade flourished, especially um, uh, where there, you know, pathway would be carried uh, usually by people along pathways. And so most often it's very um, high value goods that are traded. And one of the things that we can do is we can look at metals um, and metals being traded because those were high value goods and also because they do give kind of a signature as to where they were mined in many cases. And yeah, you know, it's very extensive. I mean, once you get once you get north of, 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 of Congo, at least, you know, once you're getting to the to the um, to the bend of, of, of West Africa, um, 
we have evidence, you know, in the area where I work, we have evidence of Asante um, and, and states to the south of Asante producing cola nut um, that went across the Sahara. Um, it went across the Sahara into the into the um, Islamic world, into the Arab, Arabic speaking world, um, because of course it was not prohibited. It was it was a um, was a, a a stimulant that was was not prohibited um, in the Islamic world, um, and traveling very far indeed. Uh, so lots of you know really long distance trade. Um, Toby, what do you want to add to that? Well, just I mean, I think one of the important things about trade is 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 one of the, f the focuses of, of my book, which is currency. You know, the existence of currencies is a marker of, of, of yeah. changing goods across different peoples, and we have that in Congo with the pre-existence of the of the Zimbu, the, 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 the shell currency, and in almost every part of Africa, uh, important currencies. In fact, one of the more, more imp most important metals in most many parts of Africa was was copper. Uh, there's a very good book by Eugenia Herbert called Red Gold of Africa, which uh, looks at that in a lot of detail. So I think that the widespread use of a variety of different currencies is a good marker for the importance of trade between different peoples. And there's another question here. Well, yeah. there, there are several. <laughs> I, oh, that, I, I haven't scrolled down. Let me see. Um, yeah. Um, um, yeah. OK, look, look, there's a bigger question about African historiography and how it changed. and. Boy, we should talk about. I mean, that 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 really demands a class. Um, on that's, its own. A, that's a big question, yeah. Yeah, because we've got to talk. We've got to, you know, you've got to talk. The the great thing about the UNESCO General History of Africa, which is actually available for download online, each one of them, right? I mean, the older versions, not these new versions, but um, is that they were edited and led by these greats of African history, um, Joseph Kizerbo, um, uh, A. Adu Boahan, um, Toyin Falola. You know who came of age and became the historians at the moment when 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 these countries were becoming independent. Um, and, and yes, they're they're great. So they they are they are great. And I I think um I, I, so yeah. I mean, historiography starts really probably from the 60s with the wave of independence, uh, as you say, Trevor, the rise of uh, of these great figures in in great universities in Africa. And I think that's a very important point. You know, this was an era where there were, the, you know, the structural adjustment policies hadn't stripped the ground from under. So people like Falola hadn't moved to the States. Uh, and pre-colonial history was really, was really one of the main things that people were interested in in African universities. And that was very important. And that all changed really in the 70s and the 80s. Uh, and the locus of, of power really moved to the US really in that, in that period for the production of, of pre-colonial history and that's never really changed I don't think since then but, but clearly I think the Until other now. thing and, to, and the other thing to say is that um I, I you know I think that over time one of the main one of the, one of the consequences I think of that has been the growing Atlanticization of, of African history in the, in a lot of the historiography you know there's more and more people like you know the late Joseph Miller who was a, a great historian of of, of, of Nongo in, in, in Angola, became more and more a historian of the Atlantic and slavery. And, and Walter Hawthorne, you could say the same, was a, a very good historian of, of, of Guinea-Bissau in the pre-colonial period and to become more an Atlantic historian. That's a process which I, I, I can see mirrored in a lot of, and I think that's been one of the, one of the trends. Um, I'm sure you could add, we could talk about it, as you say, Trevor, for a long time. <laughs> there, 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 there's a lot, I think, um... Of, of good questions coming up here, um, and again, you know, we're not going to be able yeah. to answer them this time. Um, you know, I mean, I think I think part of the problem or part of the challenge here is um, to figure out from the beginning what students are going to take away. I don't know the UK um, objectives, the standards that you're responding to as well as Toby did. All, all I can say is this: um, without a lot of time, I think it's impossible to give students a meaningful look at the history of West Africa, right? With with yeah. with five lessons, as 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 some say, um, with five lessons, what I would do is I, I think it's important to help students to um, question their presumptions and their assumptions, what they're coming to class with about Africa. I think it's important to give them uh, a sense of um, a peoples who uh, create a state. That state has a view on the world. It is unique. Uh, and yet it shares many um, elements with uh, with state building societies elsewhere. Um, and that, and that's why, you know, for me, in five lessons, you're zooming in on Benin, or you're zooming in on 
Congo, because you can do that in, in five lessons. And students will take away with them a sense of, oh, that's not the unrewarding gyrations of unimportant tribes in picturesque but out of the way places that I, that I thought it was going to be. Um, mm -hmm. and, 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 and that, that, will that questioning of their assumptions, I think, will start them, um, and, and, and learning a little bit about a people on their own terms will start them on, a, on an important pathway. Um, yeah, I think that, that thing, you, yeah. I think what you just said, Trevor, for me is the most important thing that, you know, it has to be learned about people on, on their own terms, what's significant to them. So looking at Emily's questions here, for example, your second uh, question there, what, I think that would be a good question. What did prosperity look like for different kingdoms in medieval West Africa? Because that's not thinking about an external view, it's trying to take a meaning on its own terms. Those kinds of questions, what, you know, how did people, uh, how did people conceive of their societies? Those kinds of questions, rather than something which necessarily uh, looks at a broader global picture or anything like that. And really, and then maybe right in the last class, you can bring in some elements of that because you know some, in a way, as you know, as Trevor and I, I'm sure would agree. You know, it, in the end, it's impossible to you know those questions will be asked by students, so you need to be able to address them. But that should really come at the end rather than the beginning. Yeah. Can I, yeah. I, so I'm just going to jump in here because, right. um, you know, we said that we try and finish at half past five because people have other things to do. And there are so many other questions, which is one of the reasons why we're going to try and do a follow up session um, as well. Um, so we'll, we'll log all these questions and, and see what else. And there are um, some of the questions that were submitted beforehand are really big and important questions. So we'll we'll look at those as well. Um, but first of all, um, you know, before anything else, thank all the participants for for joining in and sending the questions. Uh, thanks to Trevor and for Toby for giving up their time um, to take part in this and actually agreeing to follow that on um, and, and do some really interesting things as well. Um, if you've got any feedback, um, there will be something on um, the kind of a Google form that I'll send to you, but please email, email me. I will send all the resources as soon as I, I've done this and I don't have to feed my daughter in about 10 minutes, hopefully. Um, so I'll get that done. Uh, but please, um, you know, let us know if there's anything else that in particular that you're, that you're interested in. I think the key takeaways um, for, for me really from this whole discussion was um, the importance of sources, but not the sources that we are used to working with. Um, and I think that's really interesting for you know students to kind of uh, tackle and for us to to address and think about. And the the, the point that um, both Trevor and Toby made, which is you know looking at, at the societies in their own terms rather than trying to do a kind of international comparison. It's exactly the types of things that we do when we're teaching British history, for example. We look at Britain from the inside and say, what does this mean? And I think you know we should um, really consider that as a, as a way of, of looking at um, West Africa in terms of the Congo or, or various other places as well. So I'm going to stop it there. Thank you very, very much to everyone. Trevor and Toby, you've been immense. Uh, it's been amazing. Uh, there's so many questions that I also have, uh, but I'll try and ask you later. Um, but we'll be in touch with everyone else. Thank you very much, everyone, for attending. Thank you, everyone.